So good evening and hello everybody uh, to this e-seminar hosted by the ERA on classification propensity. My name is Daniel Chaker and I'm uh, the host uh, of this evening and I have the privilege uh, to be joined by a very distinguished faculty today. We have two panelists, um, Patrick Pedimark from the UK, um, Marcus Ketteler from Germany, and our speaker today is Martin de Borst. Uh, I would like to uh, say a few words um, about the CVs of all of them. I guess you know them, but in case you don't. Uh, so Patrick Pedimark is a professor of nephrology and consultant a nephrologist at Glasgow Renal and Transplant Unit based at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow. He's, uh, he was, is and was the lead of a series of clinical trials in nephrology ranging from stroke to vitamin K and has been founded by Kidney Research UK, MRC, NIHR, and the British Heart Foundation. So thank you very much for joining us today, Patty. Thank you. Uh, next one is Marcus Ketteler. Marcus is a professor of medicine and currently serves as, as the head of department of general internal medicine and nephrology and geriatrics at the Robert Bosch uh, Hospital in Stuttgart, Germany. And also has been uh, in the CKD MBD field for, I dare to say, decades by now, and has been the lead investigator of a number of studies uh, in, uh, involving uh, calcium, magnesium, and also phosphate. And uh, probably Marcus is best known for his role and leadership uh, in the KDGO CKD MBD controversies, contra uh, conferences, and also CKD MBD guidelines. Hi, Marcus. Thank you for being with us. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for your very kind introduction. And last, not least, I would like to introduce Martin, Martin de Borst. Martin is a consultant nephrologist and a professor of medicine at the University of Groningen. And uh, also Martin has a longstanding research interest in CKMBD and has been really um, conducting or leading uh, a number of uh, studies on classification propensity, which I would call uh, crucial. So thank you very much, Martin, for being with us today. And thank you for giving us a presentation today. Uh, some housekeeping um, issues. So this is a seminar which is jointly organized by the Eureka M, so Renal and Cardiovascular Medicine, and the CKD MBD Working Group of uh, the European Renal Association. And all attendees are eligible for one European credit uh, for your uh, CME. So please uh, stay with us after the seminar uh, for a quick uh, feedback um, uh, where we would be very happy to get your feedback to improve in future. So uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Martin and ask Martin for his talk. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the very kind introduction. The topic of today is calcification propensity uh, with the subtitle from biomarker to treatment target. So I will try to approach this from uh, as much as possible clinical perspective, whereas I realize that much of the uh, data that I will be sharing with you in the coming 25 minutes or so and that we will discuss uh, subsequently is based uh, on research settings mostly. So it is, of course, um, also then... Um, uh, well, good to, to address this in scientific discussions that we will have later today, well, later during this hour with, with the panel. These are my disclosures. Um, and then I will move on with uh, the overview of the presentation. Uh, these are the four topics that I will discuss in the coming 25 minutes or so. Uh, so first we will have a look at the uh, main uh, cardiovascular risk factors related specifically to CKD. Um, and then we will move on to uh, ways by which calcification propensity can be measured and also focusing on, on CPPs, calciprotein particles. Um, the third part is about uh, potential therapies that have been tested to uh, uh, stop the progression of calcification. And uh, I will finish with, uh, with a glimpse into the future of uh, well, management, but also um, uh, establishing um, 
uh, calcification propensity and what we still do not know or what we are about to, to, to learn in this field. But first, let's uh, start at the, um, of course, as we all know, uh, uh, very uh, relevant cardiovascular risk in our patient population, particularly advanced CKD uh, in kidney failure, uh, where our patients are at a tremendous cardiovascular risk, uh, which we only understand in part. Um, but of course, also in earlier stages of CKD already, cardiovascular risk is elevated. And if we compare this to the general population, what we've learned recently, if you look very well at very large data sets from more than a million participants all over the world, uh, then uh, you could see that approximately half of this uh, risk of cardiovascular disease is um, uh, consists of actually five uh, classical cardiovascular risk markers that are listed over here, body mass index, systolic blood pressure, uh, non-HDL, cholesterol, uh, smoking, and diabetes. So the remaining um, almost 50% of the risk remains unexplained even in a general population. And this uh, applies to cardiovascular disease, as you can see here on the left side. And looking at death from any cause, of course, the proportion is smaller for other causes of death. But um, uh, still about half remains unexplained, which intrigues me very much. But if you think about the patients that we have in front of us, then the proportion that remains unexplained is probably, or not explained by at least these five biomarkers remains uh, still higher. Um, and that is probably because other factors play a very important role in our patients. Uh, if you look at uh, on the, the blue figure, the blue half of the figure on the left side, then you can see um, across the stages of CKD from no CKD towards kidney failure, uh, the composition of various types of cardiovascular disease that our patients are affected by. Um, then you can see that still the majority of patients um, that develop our cardiovascular disease uh, do so by developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but also considerable part of it is left ventricular hypertrophy and heart failure and also pulmonary hypertension and uh, arrhythmias, of course, are, are, are important. Um, and then if we move on to the right side, then we can also learn a bit more about the underlying risk factors, where in yellow, the traditional risk factors are depicted, which... Um, uh, remain more or less stable as uh, CKD progresses, but then you can see on top of that an enormously growing uh, number of additional risk factors that are more specific to CKD. Uh, that is uh, uremia in itself, of course, contributing to uh, heart disease and also uh, vascular disease. Um, and then um, anemia, of course, plays also a very important role in the increased cardiovascular risk in CKD and uh, the tendency to volume overload, which becomes higher as our patients progress throughout CKD. And then, of course, uh, the main topic of today is uh, the disordered mineral metabolism uh, over here, which plays a considerable role in the development uh, of, uh, of cardiovascular disease in patients with CKD. And this proportion becomes uh, larger as patients progress towards kidney failure. And this is also highlighted there by an older study from 2000 already in the New England Journal of Medicine, where uh, children and adolescents with kidney failure were subjected to coronary artery uh, CT scans and uh, calcification was quantified in their coronary arteries. And this highlights to me very much that very young individuals with kidney failure already have a striking amount of calcium in their coronary arteries, underlining the relevance of vascular calcification in um, kidney failure induced um, uh, heart disease and uh, clearly also um, stimulating or promoting the, the risk of developing uh, a clinically manifest uh, disease. These are also individuals that have higher serum, potassium, serum uh, phosphate levels and also serum calcium uh, levels and also obviously calcium phosphate products. Um, having said that, it's uh, not just the elevated calcium and phosphate levels in these individuals that play a role probably because um, some individuals might be more susceptible than others to these high calcium and phosphate levels. Then um, there are clearly also other factors that contribute to the susceptibility to these high levels that, that are almost abundantly present in hemodialysis patients. So there is definitely variability in susceptibility to that. Nevertheless, calcium and phosphates are uh, very central in our management of CKD, MBD. Um, this is just a very... A uh, short summary of the uh, KDGO uh, CKD-MBD guidelines that were updated in 2017. Um, 
recently earlier this year there was uh, another KDGO meeting to have a look at these guidelines and see if they should be updated um, there should be um, an updated report uh, out in the coming months from KDGO uh, discussing this matter but what you can see is that calcium and phosphate are still very central um, in uh, as, as trigger um, by uh, for for treatment and also monitoring uh, CKD MBD and um, uh, several interventions are depicted uh, also in this uh, schedule, focusing on bone health, but also cardiovascular health, uh, in avoiding hypercalcemia by um, uh, using uh, perhaps less calcium-based phosphate binders, uh, but also, uh, of course, uh, lowering elevated uh, phosphate levels towards the normal range and limiting the intake uh, of phosphate, which are all strategies that, um, that are in the guidelines to, to optimize calcium and phosphate levels in, in CKD patients. Um, going back to um, vascular calcification, there are several ways by which this can be quantified. And I mentioned already coronary artery CT scans, uh, which you can, can see over here with uh, in white depicted, not just bone, but also here in the heart, uh, the coronary vessels that are, that are calcified using uh, Atkinson score to quantify the, uh, the calcium content. Um, and then there are more recently developed techniques using, for example, sodium fluoride PET scanning to um, quantify not only macro calcifications, which can be done by the CTs I just showed, but also micro calcification. So catching uh, vascular calcification at an earlier stage as compared to the CT uh, scans, which can be done by this uh, sodium fluoride uh, PET scanning, uh, allowing for a more sophisticated analysis of, of vascular calcification using imaging. But there are additional techniques that can be even um, used to uh, detect vascular calcification at an earlier stage and also, well, a, a different approach. Um, so, and then I'm referring to quantification of CPPs and also calcification propensity. So what do we mean by that? Um, if you take a blood sample and you add um, in, the, in a tube uh, calcium, uh, uh, chloride and also uh, sodium diphosphate and um, this uh, you leave the tube for 24 hours then uh, in this uh, sample there will be the uh, precipitation of uh, CPP so we um, discern primary and secondary, secondary CPPs uh, depicted in this schedule over here by the two, sh two shapes and you can actually just um, quantify the density of this uh, sam this sample by um, uh, and then also uh, discern that between healthy controls and kidney failure patients, there's a clear difference um, indicating that there are a lot more CPPs in blood samples uh, using this approach uh, from uh, patients with kidney failure. And you can, of course, dive into that more deeply by spinning the samples and then having a closer look at what uh, is deposited over here at the bottom of the tube. Uh, you can use, for example, a scanning electron microscopy to get a close view of these CPPs, what they look like. And then we discriminate uh, CPP1 and CPP2, the latter being the more um, dangerous one, being responsible for calcium phosphate depositions in the vascular walls and uh, other soft tissues. Uh, but you can also have a closer look at, uh, for example, the um, uh, size and the number of, uh, of the CPPs using uh, various techniques among others, the dynamic light scattering and uh, also um, using spectro spectroscopy, you can focus on the composition of the CPPs, like calcium and phosphate being the most important um, uh, parts of the uh, CPPs, but also other um, uh, components are to be, uh, can be detected using this technique. And then there is uh, the um, calcification propensity assay or T50 assay and where T50 actually uh, relates to the speed by which uh, or the rate by which CPP1 is converted into CPP2 um, as a um, reflection of the calcification propensity of the individual using this uh, serum sample in a similar approach by supersaturation of calcium chloride and sodium diphosphate. Um, so this technique that requires uh, some time because you need to uh, actually determine the time uh, by which half of the uh, CPP1 is converted into CPP2. And this is actually the reflection of calcification propensity. And then again, um, uh, more recent developments also have shown that um, uh, there's now a, um, a fax-based uh, 
technique uh, using a fluorescent biphosphonate to actually quantify uh, primary and secondary CPPs in, in blood. And this is also quite promising. It's uh, still relatively in an early stage also in terms of research, but I think we will, uh, it would be very interesting to, to use this more and more um, often to learn more about also the clinical implications of, of CPPs. This is a bit more in detail, um, the uh, T50 assay, because that has been used in uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, cohort studies over recent years. Uh, so as I explained, this depends on the uh, um, uh, prep uh, preposition of uh, calcium and uh, phosphate, uh, uh, the supersaturation if you add high concentrations, uh, ex vivo, and then you can also have a closer look using electron microscopy, but also quantify using nephilometry uh, in serum, the conversion of primary to secondary CPP is reflecting calcification propensity. And the concept is that uh, calcium and phosphate being uh, taken up from the uh, intestinal tract uh, bind to fetuin A, which is transporter molecule for, ca for calcium protein particles. It's a very important uh, molecule as well. Uh, it's uh, considered an endogenous uh, calcification inhibitor because it binds to CPPs and prevents them to su some extent from deposition in the vascular wall. But um, as individuals age, uh, and also as they are affected by diseases, for example, in our case, of course, uh, CKD, ultimately kidney failure, um, there seems to be a progressive impairment in uh, the ability to avoid this um, deposition. And the, the, so there's more formation of CPP2, and there's more deposition of that in the vascular wall. Uh, promoting vascular calcification, which seems to be one of the key processes actually driving vascular calcification. Um, then uh, the question could be, of course, what influences this propensity? So why is one individual more susceptible to developing calcification given the similar uh, levels of calcium and phosphate than others? Uh, there seem to be some genetic factors. And this is just one example, but a very prominent one, I think, because, uh, well, we performed... Um, some years ago, a, a GWAS for T50 in, uh, in a cohort that we had. And we found actually uh, the H AHSC gene encoding in A being the most important genetic driver of calcification propensity, which of course makes sense as I explained in the previous slide that um, uh, fetuin A is a very important uh, carrier protein, but also like uh, keeping uh, CPPs uh, more stable. And then it makes sense that if you have a genetic variant in that gene, that it might probably affect the deposition of, of CPPs and their role. So, um, and other genes have been identified as well and other factors uh, driving calcification propensity, which are uh, summarized here. Um, and this is of course a very uh, complex figure with a lot of components just to illustrate the uh, complexity of the uh, processes involving both passive and active deposition uh, of, uh, of calcium and phosphate in the vascular wall. Um, moving on towards more clinical factors that drive calcification propensity, several studies have been performed uh, in uh, cohorts, mostly were um, uh, either coronary artery calcification or T50 were measured. And um, then several uh, well-known factors come back all the time, like, uh, uh, of course, age, higher age as a, a predisposition to uh, calcification, uh, uh, but also uh, diabetes, of course, and dialysis vintage, which is very important, calcium phosphate itself, but also uh, magnesium, which is an uh, interesting factor, and also uh, vitamin K antagonist use, uh, vitamin K itself, also in other studies. Um, and some other uh, factors that are listed here. Um, this is uh, another study focusing on determinants of pulse wave, pulse wave velocity, where T50 in itself also was independently associated with uh, vascular stiffness. Uh, this is an inverse relationship because a higher T50 reflects a lower calcification propensity. So T50 is actually the time for the conversion. And if that's longer, it indicates um, uh, a lower calcification propensity and vice versa. So a low T50 is bad. Uh, and then, well, um, coronary artery calcification uh, is uh, quite consistently associated with a higher cardiovascular risk as reflected by this study. But for the sake of time, I will go through that uh, a bit more quickly. Um, 
we uh, did a lot of studies on, on T50 in uh, several cohorts that we have ranging from the general population to CKD and also kidney failure and transplantation. This is a study from the general population where we found that, as I mentioned, the lower T50 was associated with a higher mortality risk in the general population. And there were some subpopulations that were more, more vulnerable to uh, or more susceptible to this um, uh, effects were more uh, where the, the association was at least more pronounced. Uh, that was in uh, individuals with a higher BMI, but also with uh, with a lower EGFR and with a lower magnesium level, higher phosphate level, and individuals with diabetes. And this is for some other populations, not only worked by us, but also by uh, other cohorts like Ed Smith in Australia and also Andreas Pasch, who was actually the developer uh, among other. Uh, persons of the T50 tests in uh, in Switzerland. And here it's quite consistent that uh, individuals with the lower T50 rep representing the uh, um, uh, higher calcification propensity were at increased risk of uh, all cause uh, mortality um, in CKD here and in, and in hemodialysis here and in transplantation. Also, if you compare T50 with um, other uh, markers of, of calcium phosphate metabolism uh, and, and uh, CKD MVD um, T50 was really uh, clearly distinguishing individuals that had higher risk of mortality. So moving on to management and what can we do to correct um, uh, calcification propensity or to reduce it and to hopefully optimize uh, or reduce cardiovascular risk in our patients because that's what we're aiming at, of course, one logical step, because phosphate is such an important driver of, uh, of calcification propensity, it would make sense to first try phosphate binders and low phosphate diets. Um, these studies have been performed like uh, 10 years ago uh, initially and uh, have been rather consistently um, negative or even in the wrong direction, as this study showed, where uh, almost 150 patients with an EGFR between 20 and 45 uh, were treated with uh, several phosphate binders that were grouped then into the active treatment group and uh, compared with the placebo group. And uh, you can see that to some extent there was a reduction in, uh, in certain phosphate levels, but uh, uh, the progression of calcification was uh, rather um, more um, in the active group than in placebo group. Um, this was also uh, combined with phosphate restricted diets in some studies, uh, but uh, uh, this meta analysis summarizes uh, uh, most of the studies that, uh, that were done and concludes that the effects are rather uncertain and inestimable uh, in terms of the effects on clinical outcomes. So uh, my idea would be that um, uh, phosphate binders and, and, and dietary phosphate restriction is not the key solution to reducing uh, calcification uh, uh, progression and uh, at least additional interventions are, are needed. Well, one of that could be magnesium. I mentioned it already as a determinant of calcification propensity, but uh, uh, this has also been shown prospectively in, uh, in studies. And this is one example in CKD stage three and four in 34 patients where uh, calcification propensity was modified and was improved uh, by, uh, in also in a dose dependent way by magnesium, which is uh, quite interesting. But this was followed by a study on more clinical endpoints being um, coronary artery calcification. And then uh, unfortunately, this result was rather disappointing where the magnesium intervention did not uh, improve coronary artery calcification compared to placebo in this very well done study that was published uh, earlier this year with magnesium uh, oxide uh, two times daily, 15 millimoles compared to placebo. Um, on the other hand, um, the intervention was effective to increase plasma magnesium and also urinary magnesium excretion as a marker of uh, uh, compliance to the uh, therapy was uh, clearly different between the two groups, indicating that at least the participants had been subjected to sufficient amounts of uh, magnesium, or at least uh, sufficient in the way to uh, make these uh, curves separate. But unfortunately, the uh, primary outcome was uh, negative. Then only very briefly on vitamin K, because also additional studies have been done. And this is just one example of the, in this case, the VitaVasc study in hemodialysis patients where uh, it received um, uh, oral vitamin K1 or standard of care. Um, study that was in the end uh, smaller than was anticipated and was hoped for, but 
some promising uh, findings in terms of uh, less progression in uh, uh, aortic calcification and coronary artery calcification. Um, and of course, also uh, beneficial effects on, on markers of vitamin K status. But I think these results should be considered as preliminary and only hinting towards potential protective effects. Other studies with vitamin K have also showed um, uh, contradicting uh, results with some studies showing promising effects of vitamin K, but others being uh, clearly negative. So this is also just one component that we're targeting. Um, still question mark if that's enough. So we've come to the final part of the presentation, looking into the future. Uh, what are recent developments? And I, I, I picked just a few to show you because I think they are interesting and worth uh, to be discussed. Uh, first of all, the Calypso trial, phase B to B trial with SNF472 uh, with myoinositol hexaphosphate. Uh, that is a uh, uh, drug that inhibits the formation and growth of hydroxyapatite. Um, and uh, this is was given in the hemodialysis patients twice weekly. Uh, so it's intravenous uh, uh, dosage versus placebo. Very nice trial with um, uh, two doses also and uh, placebo control group. And the primary endpoint of this trial was the change in coronary artery uh, volume score uh, over a follow-up of uh, 52 weeks. And this was interesting because um, the drug actually indeed was able to uh, reduce the uh, amount of uh, or the volume score of coronary artery calcium uh, significantly compared to placebo. Uh, and also the Eggleston score was reduced, uh, trend towards a significance by approximately 50%, which, which is promising. Um, and then there is also an interesting, very recent study on calprotectin. Um, Calprotectin uh, uh, is, uh, was identified actually from a um, uh, proteomics uh, screen in, uh, in CKD patients, uh, stage three and four, and also in hemodialysis patients as being associated with uh, cardiovascular disease risk in these patients. And uh, as you can see here, it was also in this analysis after adjustment for several cardiovascular risk factors still independently associated with cardiovascular disease. And interestingly, this is a factor that um, can also be inhibited using, um, among others, uh, uh, Paquinimod, which is a, a drug that targets uh, calprotectin. And this is an animal study in 5-6 nephrectomy combined with a high phosphate diet. Um, these animals um, develop uh, in the vehicle group severe uh, vascular calcification. And this was reversed uh, for an important part by, by Paquinimod. Um, and uh, this is the calcium content in the vessels. Comparing the gray and the white bars, you can see the significant uh, reduction in, uh, in calcium content in the vessels. And also some uh, molecular pathways uh, involved. And, um, Interestingly, plasma calcium and phosphate levels were unchanged by the intervention. Um, and then in the second model, this was confirmed. This was um, uh, aged uh, apolipoprotein E deficient mice uh, that also developed vascular calcifications. And here the effect was also demonstrated that uh, there was less calcium content using this drug. So this is a compound that has been tested to some extent in humans, but uh, uh, not uh, for this indication at least. And uh, also um, this is something that, well, um, uh, follow-up studies should be awaited with interest, but I'm not aware of any ongoing clinical trials with this compound addressing this in uh, in the clinic. So this is still far from from clinical reality, at least at, le at least still interesting to to see these promising findings. And then, and this is another very recent interesting study, very interesting, I would say, uh, coming almost to the end of my talk. Um, uh, showing actually, uh, this is from Ed Smith's uh, group in Australia, uh, showing um, uh, different uh, types of blood samples from uh, newborn uh, children from cord blood in the, in the green circles over here, uh, compared with healthy controls in blue and also uh, peritoneal dialysis patients, so kidney failure patients in orange. And what you can see here is that the calcium content in newborn uh, in the blood uh, is, uh, is really high. 
and phosphate is also rather high. So um, this uh, might raise the question um, whether uh, newborns are at risk of developing calcification, uh, vascular calcification already. But uh, uh, remarkably, the T50 was also strikingly high in, the, in these newborns. And this is uh, then, of course, indicating a uh, protection against deposition of calcium and phosphate. So apparently, these newborns are protected uh, against the very high calcium and phosphate levels in their blood. Um, and this was not explained um, by uh, fetuin A, because this you might expect, but fetuin A levels in the newborns were uh, similar to the healthy controls, whereas the levels were lower in the kidney failure patients. Uh, interestingly, the investigators also looked at CPPs uh, because they are able to do that in their lab and uh, they were able to measure the size of CPP2, uh, which was similar in, in the newborns compared to the healthy controls. Um, but uh, the um, numbers of uh, CPMs and also CPP1 and 2, uh, well, looking at that, you could see there's a so strikingly higher number of CPP1 um, in, the, in the newborns as compared to the healthy controls, but the CPP2 particles were rather, rather similar uh, in the newborns as compared to the, uh, the healthy control adult individuals. Um, so it, it might very well be that there are, because the known uh, endogenous calcification inhibitors were uh, not explaining these findings, so there are probably additional calcification inhibitors that we are not aware of that um, uh, are the subject of uh, follow-up investigations, and hopefully uh, we can learn more and also therapeutically target them to uh, develop new, uh, new treatments. So to come to a conclusion, um, calcification propensity, in my view, is an important uh, risk factor for cardiovascular disease in CKD. Um, then uh, there are uncertainties regarding uh, how to correct calcification propensity. So we can measure it, but how to correct it uh, while magnesium, uh, as I showed as an example, may improve calcification propensity, but the clinical effects uh, are not convincing. Uh, there are some future interesting interventions, including SNF472 and Paquinimod, but uh, data are still very limited. And, uh, um, well, uh, there is some hope at the uh, horizon for the, with the discovery of novel calcification inhibitors. Uh, but still, there are uh, so many steps to take um, to uh, really uh, uh, learn more about the specific abnormal abnormalities in our patients with kidney failure, making them prone to vascular calcification. Um, and me meanwhile, I think this, um, uh, this is still an area of, of, of research that, that should be uh, continued in the future. So that is the end of my talk and um, I'm happy to take any questions. So Martin, thank you very much for this, for this nice overview over this huge broad field. <laughs> I just realized again, and what I forgot to mention uh, to all people in the audience, please, if you want to ask questions, uh, you're invited to do so by using uh, the chat um, in this Zoom session. Uh, now, in the meantime, I would like to ask the panelists uh, to comment on those finding and on this state of the art, so to say, and maybe, Petty, would you like to start? What are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. so first of all, I'd like to congratulate Martin on um, a, a great talk, really you know, um, inspired my enthusiasm for this area. I mean, I come from background looking at cardiovascular disease. I'm going to start by saying something slightly naughty, but I think it's a good way of asking a question to apologize for something. So we've not covered the aspect of gender and calcification, Clearly, we've accidentally stumbled upon uh, four genders, so I think we can apologize there. But um, but it's also to highlight the issue, are there gender-specific uh, aspects of calcification? For example, we see that uh, patients, females with chronic kidney disease are somewhat protected from cardiovascular disease, but that protection goes when you're on dialysis, and clearly that's a time of accelerated calcification. So I just wondered if, if you have, a, if you think there, that gender, sex hormones, or any of these things have a role in calcification, either protection or promotion of it. Yeah, thanks. I think this is a very interesting point and intriguing eh? because uh, uh, we, I, I think we, we know too little about this. Um, if I look at the observational data that I'm aware of from cohort studies, that uh, is that uh, gender uh, seems to have a 
somewhat smaller impact as compared to obviously age, for example, but also like phosphate and, and magnesium and bicarbonate and all these other factors that, that I that I referred to already. So if you uh, just look at um, uh, like standardized betas as a reflection of the relative importance of these factors in driving uh, or in determining calcification propensity, then gender seems to be somewhat like uh, having a smaller impact, but still it's discernible and it's statistically significant. So, um, and maybe we should look at this also in uh, in another way by doing better stratification, for example, looking really separate at at uh, uh, at men and women to see uh, to to learn more about this. Perhaps I could say one more thing. I see we've got lots of really good, great, great questions in the chat, but maybe I, I was just intrigued by the uh, the. the the calcification propensity assay. Now, that's not something that many of us are doing in clinical practice. It's certainly not available in my center. Is this something that anyone is using clinically? And if not, how many steps are we away from that in cost, availability assay, time in the lab, that sort of thing, standardization of it? And we've had a few questions about, you know, what's the gold standard for this assay? Is it the same, re reproducible? Interesting comments on that. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not uh, directly involved in establishing the T50 test in other labs, but I know that there are several centers in the world that are also uh, implementing the T50 test, uh, like um, in collaboration with uh, Andreas Marsch's group in Bern, uh, Switzerland. And uh, uh, well, what I understand is that it, this is going successfully, but it takes time, obviously, because this is not a simple uh, uh, like an ELISA test or an, a test that we could routinely uh, add to um, uh, measurements like calcium and phosphate itself that we're already doing this is like an ex vivo test where you have to add things and you have to wait and this is this is this is a bit time intensive and uh, uh, requires some efforts but it can be done i believe also reproducible uh, in in other labs um, so this is an, an area that is in development right now and uh, uh, I think it's also really important to show good data on reproducibility among centers and uh, to really make it work towards clinical implications, in addition to the actionability of it, of course. Thank you very much. I just, want, uh, I just wonder if we've got loads of questions in the chat. Uh, I wonder if we hand over to Marcus to say something. Uh, <laughs> I can answer a couple of questions in the chat. I'll type some of the easy ones that I can type. Yeah, I would... Just continue and also thank you very much for your very, very good um, overview, especially the last part, I think, was very important because um, we see that calcium and phosphate does not seem to tell a lot of the story. And um, so I think this is important also looking at vessels and bone at the same time. So um, this this was new to me. Thank you very much. Um, my question goes to the vitamin K um, uh, affinity in this regard. Uh, I think we believe that uh, the vitamin K antagonists, uh, they hamper to activate the MGP in the vessel wall. And I was, for example, surprised to see in the Kaiser study you cited that this might have even an impact on the systemic calcification propensity. And I do not have a good explanation for that. Um, have you considered or do you have an idea how this observation might have come true? Um, uh, well, it is something that in, uh, was observed in our study, but I think also in other studies, uh, it was also uh, uh, found. And uh, it is also in line with uh, uh, studies that compared, for example, patients on VKA versus DOAC. Um, also, um, I, I'm aware of a European Heart Study, uh, European Heart Journal study, where so uh, groups of patients on on DOAC versus VKA were compared, and um, then also coronary artery calcification was compared among the two groups, and there was a clear, um, uh, like a more uh, a stronger increase in vascular calcification in the in the patients on VKA. Uh, but you are asking about the mechanism by which it, uh, the VKA could influence uh, the systemic calcification propensity, right? Yeah, I was wondering how this could impact on, for example, T50 measurements, um, because it, I would think it would be limited strictly to the vessel wall. 
Um, and this is what actually uh, the knock-in, knock-out experiments showed in the beginning. So uh, this seemed to me, if this would impact on T50 measures, as if uh, vitamin K has additional effects uh, that kind of transfer into the circulation. And uh, this would be new to me, at least. Yeah, it's quite interesting because I think there are many vitamin K dependent processes. It's not just MGP, huh? so uh, this is just one of the well, the, the best known example, of course. But there are additional molecules that also are processes that are that are driven by or dependent on on vitamin K, um, and also, of course, uh, beyond the coagulation cascade. Uh, uh, but I think also related related to vascular calcification. Yeah. Another point that goes back a little bit back into the history of, of this uh, goes back to observations of Sharon Moe in uh, her experimental models, where she found that uremia per se, or the, the magnitude of uremic toxicity, might directly impact on um, calcification processes. Um, during your recent research and, and preparation of this talk, did you come over to any T50 measurements that differed, for example, pre and post dialysis or um, uh, from dialysis to transplantation? So by triggered by improvements of, of kidney function, did you see anything that um, was longitudinally looking at this on this uh, parameter? <laughs> Uh, there are limited studies on longitudinal measurements of T50, I believe. Um, I can say something about that, but um, uh, this is still preliminary because uh, we are still uh, in the process of analyzing data from uh, a large uh, transplant cohort that we have. So that's a little bit the other way around, but we have samples already before transplantation. So in the dialysis stage and uh, at several time points after transplantation, and we were able to look at uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the uh, course of T50 over time in these individuals. And there it was very clear that T50 improved after transplantation, uh, but also if as kidney function starts to deteriorate again, T50 was going down as well again. Yeah. I also see that there are many questions in the Q&A. I haven't looked at them so far, so I would like to hand over to Daniel at this point, and then we probably join uh, with uh, giving those questions back to you, Martin. Thank you. Yes, please, so I'll jump in now. So we have several question, questions regarding denosumab, DMAP. Uh, is there a role for DMAP in preventing calcification, vascular calcification? Are we aware of any data? Yes, um, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, there, there have been, there has been some data uh, generated. I, I thought of putting it in the presentation, but uh, well, the time was just too short to put it all in. The, there have been some studies on denosumab and also in relation to vascular calcification recently. Um, my interpretation of those studies is that they are um, so far not clear enough to really. Um, uh, let us use the, or allow the use of the nosumab for indication of vascular calcification in, in CKD. Whereas these findings are, are highly interesting, of course. So uh, it would be great if we could generate even more data to learn more about what is exactly going on, also using prospective studies. But um, the, the data that I've seen are some studies are positive, uh, showing uh, 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 stabilization or even a slight decrease in vascular calcification in patients receiving the nosumab as compared to controlled treatment, whereas other studies showed absolutely no difference. Um, so I think the, uh, the jury is not out yet, um, or st still out there, actually, I should say. Yeah. It's, is this, uh, is this, is yeah. this kidney healthy or kid CKD patients you're, you're talking about? With uh, th that is actually hemodialysis and, and, and also CKD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marcus, may I say something to this? Because I would like to advise some caution here. Because um, on the one hand, compared to the bisphosphonates, denosumab is lacking this pyrophosphate potential. So if denosumab improves the bone in a way that, for example, more calcium phosphate can be caught, this may have an impact. I don't believe that it has a, much of a direct impact at the vessel wall. There is one very impressive case report from Japan where a dialysis patient uh, got into a state of severest 
hypocalcemia and required as much vitamin D and calcium that within only six months, I believe, um, uncalcified vessels started to calcify tremendously, um, which is then again logical because the denosumab as an anti-resorptive blocks the bone completely to catch that. And uh, if then there is such an overwhelming calcium uh, dosage to require a calcium of a young ionized calcium of let's say above 1.7 1.8 um, there was even an adverse effect so i would uh, advise caution although i would not find it impossible that in some settings it works but i don't think it's uh, something we should bet on no i fully agree yeah that is there's definitely a downside in terms of severe hypocalcemia which uh, probably we all recognize if we if we use the nosum up uh, sometimes in, in patients with uh, more advanced kidney disease. Yeah. It works beautiful on the bone. I used it yeah. in, in many patients. The decreases in T-score and uh, the increases in T-score are yeah. tremendous yeah. Uh, yeah. if it works. But um, hypocalcemia is an issue and then the load might uh, contradict the uh, improvements. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have further questions uh, from the chat. So Martin and... Uh, all of you, are you aware of any data regarding PPIs? Because PPIs, uh, proton pump inhibitors, are known to induce hypomagnesium, magnesemia. Are you aware of any data linking PPIs to vascular calcification? Uh, not specifically vascular calcification, but I think there have, has been some observational studies linking PPI use with adverse cardiovascular outcomes uh, in, in several populations, in fact. Uh, so whether this is really true, a detectable effect on calcification, I am not aware of such data. And I think you would need, because the impact is probably rather small, but still, I think we, uh, we start to learn more about these drugs that uh, were once considered to be completely free of side effects, which is clearly not the case. And hypermagnesemia is, of course, rather common with PPI. Um, and since magnesium determines uh, uh, calcification propensity inversely, um, it, makes, it makes sense in a way. But um, yeah, it could be one, just one component of, uh, of the calcification process that, uh, that is triggered by, by the PPI. So it could make sense. I'm not aware of convincing data really proving it, but perhaps the other panelists have seen studies. No, no but, but PPIs also block uh, part of the calcium uptake. So maybe that's kind of counteracting, yeah. <laughs> counteracting this out. Yeah. So another question regarding head dynamic bone disease, because we, we talked about bone um, only very little so far. So a number of questions, but uh, Martin, what would be your, your best view on patients with low bone turnover and head dynamic bone disease? Any data there, whether this is linked to... Um, a uh, high calcification propensity of blood, because as, as Marcus um, told us in this example of the Japanese patients, so maybe we lack a buffering system uh, if the uh, bone is in low or adynamic turnover. Yeah, um, this is of course, there. there, there is in, in, in some patients always this conflict between the bone and the vasculature. Huh? So are you protecting the bone uh, with uh, the risk of uh, uh, increasing calcification or the other way around? And um, yeah, I would, I would tend to focus on, on calcium and phosphate levels when uh, faced with the patients with very low uh, vitamin D levels and low uh, bone turnover, low PTH. Um, so uh, if calcium uh, stays within the acceptable range, I would still uh, be willing to, to use vitamin D in, in this context. Thanks. So uh, what about vitamin K? Because vitamin K is actually not vitamin K, it's a whole family. Are you aware of uh, differential effects uh, like uh, MENIQ7, MK4, um, other pros and cons you are aware of or all of you are aware of? 
Yeah, maybe maybe Patty can can also join in answering this one uh, as an as an expert in this field. Uh, uh, my my I showed of course the the Vita Fusk with which was with was with um, vitamin K one. Um, I always thought that vitamin K two tended to have a little bit more protective effect in terms of vascular calcification inhibition, um, but um, in the end, differences might not be that that huge. What do you think about that? Well, I think I think it's probably more to it than that. So so yeah, so we've done a trial of vitamin K two, uh, which we published in Jason, and there are others. There's the Valkyrie study, and there's a couple ongoing. Best of my knowledge, um, it's it's only the K one trial that's really shown anything, and it's such a small trial, but nevertheless, it's positive showing a regression of calcification. And there there is the um, the paper by. Uh, Logos group showing differential effects on vitamin K being incorporated into um, you know, lipid raft and cells, things like that, which may, be, may explain its effect in uremia where K2 doesn't have that effect. So I think there might be something different in that. And of course, that's been a challenge with all the vitamin K studies that you either think of oh, vitamin K, it's a wonder bus. You give somebody K2, they will still reduce to some degree um, the uncarboxylated matrix GLA protein. So it's clearly having some effect on a serological marker of calcification. But that's just not been proven in the trials. And of course, the challenge is that reversing calcification once it's there is, is really hard. Um, prevention trials take much longer and you have to image lots of vascular body, body, so, body. So these trials are really hard to do. Um, and the final thing I'll say about vitamin K is that the problem with vitamin, the good or bad thing about vitamin K is it's often available from health food shops, um, so it's not necessarily regulated to quite the same degree of GMP that you would for conventional CTEMP trials of investigative medicine. So it's, so it's quite challenging to do these trials. Um, you know, and the companies selling them often are more enthusiastic to pursue the health market rather than the um, you know medical market. So I've not, I don't know the other guy. guy I, I've not given up on vitamin K as a as a intervention of interest, but I think greater thought needs to be done for planning any ongoing trials. And you know, if the K1 story is true, then an outcome trial will be the next step. So uh, interested if anyone else is keen to keep going with vitamin K1. Yeah, I fully agree that uh, we should probably search in the, uh, like more in the prevention setting than in actually trying to reduce already existing calcifications. And uh, as, as you said also, this is what we were struggling with as well in, in thinking of a study design that would make sense and that would be also doable because uh, of course, if you need to do prevention, you would have to wait a really long time and include a really huge number of patients in order for uh, for a decent trial to be uh, like showing anything meaningful. Um, so then it will be really challenging to to demonstrate this. But um, yeah. But would, you agree, would all of you agree is that one should avoid warfarin at least and favor DOAX or not? Unless there's an indication for warfarin where DOAX, uh, you know, such as prosthetic valves, is the one yeah. where you can't, you have to go for the, the, yeah. the for the conventional uh, warfarin. For everything else, it's just it's another reason why warfarin is is unappealing in people on on dialysis. Um, I'd never say never because we don't have a good trial. I think there's a trial just about to start or just started in Scandinavia called SAFE, I think, or something like that, which is comparing Hixman versus um versus Warfarin. But you know, all the trials at Axia, Germany and Renal AF um have had their own challenges as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm not fan I'm not a fan. I'm not an enthusiast for Warfarin and people in, uh, with on, on dialysis, that's for sure. I was quite um, glad about the small renal AF trial because this, although again a very very small sample, but it at least indicated a little bit that the reduced dose uh, epixaban may be relatively safe in dialysis patients, um, which we were not really aware of. Even the uh, uh, the approval in the US was not not based on patient data, so. Um, I think this is something that makes it a little bit easier to use the substances. And I try to avoid vitamin K antagonists whenever I can in CKD, of course, in advanced CKD. Yeah. 
So for the question, a tough one, uh, what about acid-base balance, alkalosis, acidosis, in terms of uh, calcification propensity of blood, I guess, and vascular calcification? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a tricky one. I see you're smiling already because uh, uh, some studies, I think observational studies have shown links between um, uh, metabolic acidosis and calcification propensity. But if you try to address that in prospective studies by correcting uh, acidosis, and I think this is a study that you contributed to as well, uh, Daniel, where uh, calcification propensity was not improved by after correction of acidosis, right? Or oral bicarb, yes, didn't do Yeah, much. no. Yeah, so there's the feeling that uh, acidosis would sort of protect vessels from calcification. Uh, and at the same time, at least associative uh, data indicate that the higher the bicarb level, the better for T50. So this is like totally divergent. So we don't know yet, quite frankly. No, no, no. There, there was always a lot of speculation whether the most dangerous situation for a hemodialysis patient is being dialyzed against a relatively high serum calcium and then at the end of the dialysis where acidosis correction or overcorrection occurs and at the same time there is a lot of uh, calcium availability but this has never been tested it's difficult to test whether there is huge deposition into the vessels at this moment but this is something maybe a situation that is uh, important for the choice of the dialysate calcium concentration yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, would make sense. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, so I browse through the questions. Unfortunately, we will not be able to answer all the questions now orally, but we will answer, try to answer all the questions uh, then in writing. So last one, maybe what about pyrophosphate? Again, a tricky one, pyrophosphate and vascular calcification and calcification propensity of blood. Um, associations. I think uh, pyrophosphate is quite hard to measure, isn't it, to begin with? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, definitely. I don't. Uh, I don't actually know much about the potential role of pyrophosphate in this context and whether it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can chime in. There are, I think, two points that can be made, at least one is from the experimental point of view. Um, there are a number of studies where the pyrophosphate-like effects of bisphosphonates have been uh, uh, discussed. And there is also, for example, the treatment of the Keutel syndrome, um, a, a Dutch study that uh, showed in four of uh, three or four affected children that etindronate uh, blocked the ca vascular calcification uh, in these newborns very efficiently. So this may be an indicator here. The other story I think is behind the interesting mortality associations of alkaline phosphatase, because uh, it is to me relatively unclear how uh, that relationship or which pathobiological background is here. But one potential explanation is that uh, high alkaline phosphatase activity at least uh, degrades pyrophosphates and, and thereby uh, leads to a lesser protection here. But this is highly speculative. So uh, it may also reflect a high turnover bone that may be not good for cardiovascular disease, but this could be a potential mechanism in these associations. And the studies were very, so Kalanta Sade, I think Japanese studies showed that that could be a mechanism here. Yeah, that, that's very intriguing in mentioning alkaline phosphatase because alkaline phosphatase, as far as I know, has a direct and linear relationship with cardiovascular outcomes. So the lower, the better. Um, and calcification propensity of blood T50 is the other way around. Linear relationship, the higher, the better. And all other markers we are currently looking at, uh, calcium, phosphate, magnesium, typically U-shape. So this is very interesting. Yeah, so it's uh, one minute to six. Um, I'm afraid we have to close here. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Marcus, uh, for being with us today. I would like to thank the ERA for having us. Uh, thank you, the audience, uh, for joining us today. I hope uh, you you. 
found something to take home with you or maybe you are already at home so <laughs> keep it at home